Welcome, everybody. Um, welcome to our dementia workshop on dementia conversations. I'm Eric Rohr. I'm the owner of Assisting Hands here in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I'm, glad, I'm happy to bring you this dementia workshop, and we're partnering with Brooke Brockdorf with Brookdale in Midlothian, uh, Virginia, which is right here in the greater Richmond area. So, Brooke, I'll leave it to you to kind of talk about our second Thursdays, and Kathy, if you can advance the slide, that'd be great. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see, see you guys on the call. These workshops keep growing, which is fantastic. We have a series of workshops. We do them um, every Thursday or second Thursday, I should say, of every month. Um, typically, and it's been kind of what we've done in the past, 10 a.m. seems to work for everybody. Um, so that's why you'll see that time now. Future weeks, if there's anything our month comes along and we feel that um, an afternoon would be better. We hear that a, a change in time might be necessary for other people to be able to join. Um, we may make that change. So that's why you'll see the TBDs on the following um, months to come. Uh, but typically, unless we hear differently, we'll stick with the, with the 10 a.m. Uh, the purpose for the workshops is exactly that. Um, being in the senior industry, in different capacities and have worked um, with assisting hands with our residents. Um, you know, we wanted to be a resource uh, for the community. We wanted to be a place where people could learn more, understand more, um, and openly ask questions, um, voice concerns. Um, we're here to help. You know, we each, um, we're, we're in senior living every day and, and our goal is to, like I said, be that resource, provide these workshops, um, and, and help answer any questions that you have. And if, if we don't have the answers, um, Kathy does. No, <laughs> most of the time she does. Um, and even if Kathy doesn't have the answer, you know, we, we've got such a huge network of people that keeps growing that we would, we're always here to try and help put you in, in touch with um, which, you know, who could help. So um, we, <clears throat> Kathy, Eric, and I have an immense amount of passion um, for our seniors and what we do and these workshops. Um, it comes from a place of love, personal experience, uh, what we do day to day, um, and really just <clears throat> what I like to call, excuse me, a, you know, basically a servant's heart. So um, without further to do, the biggest heart of this, of this, of this uh, workshop, Kathy, I'm going to turn it over to her so she can talk a little bit about, um, about herself and we can get the workshop started. Thanks, Eric and Brooke. Um, again, it's my pleasure to be here with everyone. I hope we learn a little bit. I know I learn something different every time, and so I'm excited to get started. Um, so today, our workshop goals are going to be to try to understand a brief overview of dementia. We'll identify some strategies to have successful conversations about dementia, learn specific components conversation techniques around the following topics. And these are the three things that are the hardest for people to talk about. Going to the doctor, when to stop driving, financial matters. And then we've got some other resources for you. Um, but before we start, I've got a poll question for you. I'd like to try to get a feel for how many of you have been diagnosed with dementia have a family member living with dementia or providing care to someone living with dementia? Just give it a couple more seconds here. Looks like about everybody, most people have Submitted some answer. All right. All right. So it looks like, you know, it's pretty good mix of everything. So we have some people that either have dementia or uh, know someone living with dementia, or they're a professional in the industry, like um, Brooke, Kathy, and I, who um, provide care or some kind of support for people living with dementia, but we have a few people that just wanna learn more. And I really applaud those that are in that place. You know, I, I've run into circumstances. I wish I had learned more about dementia before I actually had to deal with situations with individuals living with dementia. So hats off to you for being proactive um, in uh, learning more. 
So, all right, Kathy. Okay, we're gonna take a little overview right quick. Um, dementia is the umbrella term for a person's decline in memory and other cognitive abilities that is severe enough to interfere with their daily life. It is not normal aging. Currently, it's estimated that there are approximately 50 million individuals in the world with 5 million of them in the United States living with dementia. Uh, this number will probably double every 20 years and reaching 75 million around 2030 and then 131 million people in 2050. And this goes with all of the research that's going on. Um, they are currently identifying over 100 different types of dementia, more coming every single day. There are four things that we need to remember about dementia. One is at least two parts of the brain are dying. It keeps changing and getting worse. It's very progressive. It's not curable or fixable. It's chronic and it does result in death, making it terminal. But while fatal, some people can live very long lives, but oftentimes there's probably another underlying health issue that could hasten death. Um, there are four main types of dementia that we primarily see with Alzheimer's being uh, number one, dementia with Lewy body, vascular dementia, and frontotemporal dementia. Um, you can also see a combination of these at any given time. And some of them also are in combination with Parkinson's disease. Um, an interesting note though, is that they've shown that autopsy studies in brains over 80 years old who had dementia, it indicates that many of them had a combination of types of dementia uh, with Alzheimer's and vascular and Lewy body all being the most common. So when we're trying to understand uh, about a little bit about dementia, there's several causes and risk, risk factors that you need to be aware of. Advancing age is, is probably the biggest, um, but dementia can also affect people as young as 40, 50, and early 60s. If you have a family history of dementia, that puts you at a greater risk of de developing the disease yourself. Um, genetics plays a big fact. Uh, risk factors and brain health like alcoholism, drug addiction, diabetes, uh, those all play a big factor. Um, and then a lot of people that are diagnosed with Down syndrome will develop the early onset of dementia by middle age. I'm kind of sad. <clears throat> um, we've got several common symptoms of dementia. Of course, the memory loss that disrupts your daily life changes, challenges in planning or solving problems, difficulty completing familiar tasks, confusion with time or place, trouble understanding uh, virtual images and spatial relationships. You might see problems with words and speaking and writing, misplacing things, and, and, my Zoom. and un, un, losing the ability to find them, decreased or poor judgment, withdrawal from work or social activities, changes in mood or personality. Um, but keep in mind, although some dementia is, dementia is chronic, there are some treatable medical conditions that mimic these signs of dementia. Uh, for an example, severe depression can cause many of these same symptoms. So just don't assume that changes in personality or memory loss means a person has dementia or that their, treat, their condition is untreatable. This is a case where you really need to seek medical help immediately. Um, it's very hard to have difficult conversations when we see signs of changes in someone's judgment because of dementia. So how can we be proactive when we see initial red flags that would make it easier to have these conversations? How could you approach difficult conversations when topics like finances, stopping driving, or it's time to move into long-term care can be ticking time bombs with the wrong approach? So what I want to do is set you up for structuring set successful com conversations. Um, dementia inevitably gets worse over time. People with dementia gradually have a more time 
difficult time understanding others as well as just communicating in general. So you definitely want to create a positive um, conversation environment with uh, avoiding distractions, speaking clearly and naturally in a warm, calm voice. Um, be prepared to listen actively. Don't quibble or argue. It's not worth it. Refer to the people by their names. Um, use nonverbal cues. You might need to use hand gestures, eye gestures, uh, signs, things like that. Have patience and certainly understand that there's gonna be some good days and there's gonna be some bad days. So have a conversation in the early stages of the disease as, if possible before the situation gets dangerous or risky. It's easier to start hard conversations when the situation is just annoying. Understand how difficult the conversation can be for both you and the person living with dementia. So try starting with little discussions. Ask how it's going for them in that particular area of their life. Um, ask the person living with de dementia if he or she would like to know if you notice any changes and what those changes are. I would suggest that you practice your conversation in advance. Uh, rehearse it with someone you, who else who knows your loved one. Um, consider the possible reactions that you might get and try out different ways to respond. And then ask for feedback from your friend on which approaches were most helpful and what you probably should change. Talk when you're both relaxed and comfortable. Do not focus on the fears and changing behaviors. Avoid making the person living with dementia feel guilty or afraid. Um, you might want to make sure that things are in place to support moving forward with the change. And then decide if really decide if you're the best person to have this conversation with them. Or is, or is there another family member, friend, or professional that they might be more open with? Hey, Kathy, real quick, before you leave that slide, if you can go back real quick, I think that last bullet point, avoid making the person living with dementia feeling guilty or afraid is so important. You know, I think is, you know, in our society, there's so much stigma attached with mental, uh, you know, illnesses and you kind of mental behaviors. Um, and I think that what we have found in the individuals we have dealt with, and I know Brooke has, is lots of times families don't get the necessary help because of that stigma and they, they, they do feel guilty or afraid and we definitely do not add to that. This is not their fault. This is not something that anybody asks for. So I think being understanding and taking it as, you know, it's like any other illness um, or disease that you're trying to get them help and, um, and you need to treat them with dignity and respect. So I just want to kind of underscore that point. And you'll hear Kathy talk about that as we go through this workshop as well as all of our workshops. Okay, so one of the first conversations we're going to talk about is going to the doctor. And it can be a barrier because of fear anger, stigma, diagnosis, checkups, trying to get medical help. Taking a loved one to visit a doctor about their mental health is just plain uncomfortable, no matter how you, how you dish it out. So how do you explain your concerns to their doctor without embarrassing your loved one? How do you let them maintain some respect? What do you do if your loved one strongly denies that there's a problem? How do you get them to go to their doctor in the first place? So many caregivers struggle with what to tell their loved one about a doctor's visit. It's all about how you prepare them that's gonna make the difference. So treat it like any other preventative medicine visit. Um, like you're going to have an x-ray, a bone density test, or you just tell them you're going for a brain checkup. Most people will accept that. Um, so oftentimes elderly parents do not want to burden their children with their ailments, uh, which is why adult children need to voice their worry and concerns by making the issue their issue. So set the tone, let them know that we are here to see if a doctor can keep them memory, keep their memory going for the next 10 or 20 years. So a good conversation starter would be, 
I worry about you and seeing what the doctor says would make me feel better. I would rest easier knowing that we have the most up-to-date information about your health. And you're going to want to use words that are more comfortable for the person to understand. Um, one of the things that you might want to suggest is Medicare's free annual wellness visit. A lot of people do not take advantage of that. Um, take, take them out to lunch when you're going to the doctor's visit. Go do hair, do nails, do something, but make it fun. Make, have a fun outing along with your doctor's visit. If you feel the need, invite other family members to communicate their questions for the doctors. And if your person living with dementia is still reluctant, try using a little therapeutic fib. Just tell them you're going to the grocery store and it just happens to be by the doctor's office. Um, so hey, Kathy, real quick on that one. I know there's a lot of debate about that, you know, about using the therapeutic fib or the white lies about that. Um, and I think that probably also determines like how advanced do you think the cognitive impairment is? Um, and I think we'll talk about this in the next dementia workshop when we go over the gems, the various stages. But I think that, you know, there's probably um, strategic times to use that um, in kind of for their overall well-being. And then there's other times that would just be an insult. So you got to really kind of know, have to know the person of when that's going to be effective, so. Yeah, and that goes back to, are you really the right person to be having this conversation or should that somebody else be doing it? Um, but one of the things that you'll definitely want to do is somehow contact the doctor before routine checkups. You don't want to just show up for a scheduled appointment to express your concerns about dementia, you probably need to prepare the doctor in advance for this visit. Um, get your medicine list together, write down the samples of changes that you've noticed in your loved one, and make a list of questions to ask. And when you get, do get to the doctor's office, you're gonna wanna set the tone for showing respect to your loved one. Um, we don't talk about them or around them, include them in the conversation. Um, revisit with the doctor all the documents that assist with making future decision-making care. Be ready to ask and answer questions and take notes during the appointment. If you don't understand something, be sure to ask for clarification. It's also good to go ahead and start the discussions with future care, whether it be short-term or long-term, and then ask your doctor for some recommendations, but leave with a plan. Write down any instructions or tasks that need to be addressed between now and your next appointment, including any tests that need to be scheduled, appointments with other doctors, um, details about changes in treatment or care. You want to be cognizant of concerns or instructions to share with your other caregivers so that you're all on the same page. And make sure that you understand behaviors or changes in the signs or symptoms and what to look for. It's also important to do some of these. Ask the person living with dementia if it is okay for you to share samples of behaviors you have witnessed. You might want to request a memory screening. Keep it positive. Don't focus on the person's deficits. Um, you know, it's not about what we've lost. It's about where we're going and where we are now. Acknowledge their fear. It's normal to be worried and fearful if you suspect something is wrong with your brain and everyday abilities. But you still need to be persistent, but always persist gently. And again, never with anger. Um, invite family members to communicate their concerns and questions. But lastly, throughout any discussions, Work to keep your loved one as involved as possible and let them have some control over these conversations. The next one is when do we stop driving? This is again, um, another very touchy topic. Although you may want to avoid dealing with this often sensitive topic about driving, you need to know the signs that would suggest that your parent or loved one can no longer drive safely. And in addition, learn what steps you can take if your loved one is a danger on the road but refuses to stop driving. So have you noticed accidents, scrapes, 
mistakes while driving, driving too slow, hazardous driving, and other questionable activities. Um, when an individual is diagnosed with dementia, one of the first concerns that families and caregivers face is whether or not the person should drive. Many people will associate driving with their self-reliance and freedom, and the loss of driving privileges is likely to be upsetting. But many older drivers don't realize that their driving skills are getting worse due to medical or biological reasons. So some individuals recognizing the risk will limit or stop driving on their own. Others are unable to access their own driving skills and may want to continue driving even though we know it's longer, no longer safe. Some people are just in denial about their abilities and these drivers are at a higher risk to receive traffic tickets and be in accidents. And you may have to intervene when an individual's symptoms pose to, great, to greater traffic risk than they are today. So some of the conversations, people with mild dementia are at a much, I'm sorry. Kathy, I just, I had a quick question for you. Okay. Um, when it comes to kind of that last bullet point on the last slide was, you know, families may need to intervene. Um, we actually have a family currently um, who's, who's one of their parents is here with us. They would very much, the kids would very much like to have um, their other parent here as well. Um, he is pretty hesitant. Um, he does have dementia, um, but he's very, I'm fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with me. Um, and he will still drive every once in a while against family's wishes. Um, we all do not believe that it is safe. So if families do find themselves in that situation, and it is to the point where they do need to intervene um, because the polite, or the, I don't wanna say polite, but the previous conversations aren't working. Um, what advice would you, how do they go about doing that? I guess, um, if they know that it is an actual safety concern, is there a specific person that they contact? Is there an agency they contact? Um, how is that done? Do you know? Yep, and actually we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Perfect. Okay. Sorry, jumping ahead. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> um, people with mild dot, uh, dementia are at a much higher risk of unsafe driving compared with people of the same age without dementia. So some of the signs that you want to look for, okay, uh, of course, are loss of coordination, um, difficulty in judging distances, um, getting lost or feeling disoriented, going to familiar places, uh, the memory loss is increasing day by day. They're struggling with decision making and problem solving. Um, there's difficulty in processing information. They could be confusing the gas and brake pedals, and they can also become angry or confused while they're driving. These are all signs that you need to say, hmm, we might need to think about where we're going here. Um, poor driving signs, they are driving too slowly or they're speeding, stopping in traffic for no reason, ignoring traffic signs. Um, typically, someone with dementia is going to be one of the first ones to run a stop sign and run red lights and not understand ver uh, yielding and merging those kinds of things. It gets too confusing for them. Um, they become lost on a familiar route. Uh, they don't have good judgment and they have difficulty seeing pedestrians, objects or other vehicles on the road. And they forget that pedestrians always have the right of way. Um, they have accidents near misses or fender benders. And 80%, 86% of traffic fatalities in older drivers happen on side roads, believe it or not, and byways only 14% happen on major highways. So I think older people think, well, I just shouldn't drive on the, on the highway. Well, now we're learning that they shouldn't drive, period. Not in the neighborhood, not around the block, anywhere. Um, some other things, uh, additional um, evaluation strategies, uh, ask them to be your co-pilot. Um, tell them to 
observe you driving and let them know, let you know about any things that they see that you haven't done. Did you miss a turn signal? Did you uh, change lanes and not follow the rules of the road? Let them, let them tell you about that. Look for frustrations and the, their capabilities to stay focused while you're driving. If they get frustrated easily or lose their focus regularly, it's probably time for an independent driving evaluation. Um, I mean, and I was going to say, Kathy, on that one, too, about the co-pilot, it may be just you may say, hey, we're going to go to the grocery store. I want you to give me turn by turn directions. Tell me when to brake. Tell me when to turn. Tell me when to accelerate and tell me how to get there. And that way you're in control of the car. Obviously, if they tell you they don't tell you to stop and you're heading into a red light and you're going to hit, you can then stop. But then they're verbally trying, they're verbally giving you all the instructions and you can see how quickly they're able to respond and remember how to get places. I think that's a really good strategy. Now, I'm not sure about other states, but I will tell you that Virginia has no laws against driving with dementia. Um, but they obviously have laws about driving with medical conditions, which impair and a person's ability to drive safely. So what we suggest is arrange an independent driving evaluation. Um, it's just designed to evaluate cognition, judgment, and reaction times and their visual and spatial perceptions. So here in Virginia, we have a DMV cognitive impairment policy that drivers with a true diagnosis of cognitive impairment of any severity or a diagnosis of dementia, and remember I said diagnosis, not just our suspicions, but they must be able to pass the um, Department of Motor Vehicles knowledge test. They're gonna have to provide a medical report before the skills test is even administered. And they're gonna have to be monitored every six months by a driver rehabilitation specialist. And if they do not pass the driving test, the DMV will take away their license. So because the progression of dementia varies um, individual to individual, some have demonstrated the ability to drive safely and they'll start to modify their driving. They'll try to reduce the risk of an accident by doing this. So you want to encourage driving only on familiar roads and avoid long distances. Avoid heavy traffic and heavily traveled roads. Avoid driving at night and in bad weather. Um, we all know that as we get older, our vision does change. Driving at night and in bad weather becomes a problem for people without dementia. You can only imagine what it is with somebody who has dementia because their vision changes a lot more rapidly than ours does. Um, so, Reduce the need to drive, have groceries, meals, prescriptions, things like that delivered to their home for them. Um, there are a lot of barbers and hairdressers that will make house calls. Invite family and friends to come over for regular visits to keep the socialization up and them not to get lonely. And arrange for families and friends to take the person living with dementia out on social outings. It might be for a dinner or for a lunch or to a movie or just maybe to go to the park and watch the animals and the children. Um, it might be time to make arrangements for alternative transportation. A family and friends, a lot of people don't wanna rely on them, but it is a necessity. Public transportation is out there. Um, there's taxis, Ubers, or Lyfts. Um, Uber and Lyft will offer specials for um, seniors, regardless of whether or not they have dementia. And there's senior and special needs transportation services. Um, like here in Richmond, we have the care van. You make, you make um, an appointment, they'll come and pick you up, they'll take you to wherever you need to go and they'll bring you back home. And also services like the ones that Eric and I have, we also provide transportation to elderly people who need to get to appointments, doctor's offices, grocery stores, whatever. So there's other, other services. But remember, um, people living with dementia who are still able to maintain an active lifestyle will often adjust better to the loss of driving 
when the privileges are slowly taken away. So here's just some other tips for you. Um, plan ahead before any accident occurs. Um, express your concern about specific changes that you've noticed. Appeal to the person's sense of responsibility and yours and their concern for other people on the road. Um, other alternate plans for transportation, just let them know that you've thought about this. You may have to have a doctor or someone else tell them that they're, they shouldn't drive anymore. But most important, have empathy because we are taking away some of their independence. Now, to answer your question, Brooke, when per, gentle pers, per, persuasion fails, um, you can hide the car keys or a thing that you can do is replace the keys with a set that will not start the car. There are, you can disable or sell the car. Um, there's, you can ask your mechanic to install what's called a kill switch that has to be engaged before the car will start um, and then move the car out of sight. But another thing is um, ask them if they have someone special in their life, a recent grad, a child or a grandchild that they would like to gift the car to. Um, sometimes if you ask them that way, they're, it's easier for them to give up driving because they do want their loved ones to share something special with them. And I think Kathy on that too, um, kind of your previous kind of points is you can't just get the car away from them. You're gonna have to make alternative plans for how they're gonna need to be transported places. and. You know, this is, you know, taking away a lot of their freedom, which, you know, I, I think is, you know, driving is associated with that independence and freedom. So you're going to have to figure out how to do you enable their independence and freedom in other ways. You just, you know, just taking away the car is it's dealing with certain issues. It protects them. It protects others, you know, keeps them from getting in accidents and all those things. But you need to make sure you have a plan for all the things that taking the car away um, represents. How do you, you know, somewhat create proxies for that independence and their ability to get around and see their friends and so they don't become even more isolated because one thing, and I know Brooke can talk to this as well, during this pandemic, isolation absolutely accelerated the symptoms and the onset of dementia and made it worse. And so we can't create isolation zones by taking away driving. So we have to be prepared. To how do we keep them from feeling isolated? So. Okay, the next thing we're going to talk about is that's a difficult conversation. Legal and financial decisions. You probably feel reluctant, uncomfortable, intrusive, and disrespectful talking to your parents or your loved ones about these things, but you have to talk about um, you have to take time to have these conversations. It's the most kind, thoughtful, and loving thing you can do, and be honest. So who will make the health care and or financial decisions when the person is no longer able to do it? While it's a difficult topic to bring up, getting their wishes down on paper means that they'll be preserved and respected by all members of the family. How will care needs be met? Sometimes family members assume that a spouse or their nearest family member can take care, can take on the caregiving, but that's not always the case. Caregiving is a major commitment that gets bigger as the dementia grows. Family members may have their own health issues, jobs, and responsibilities. Communication is essential to make sure that the needs of the person living with dementia are met and that the caregiver has the support to meet those needs. So time, kinds of things that you need, these are the documents that you should put in place um, for medical purposes. Kathy, and a, Kathy, I'm, Kathy yes. I'm sorry, real quick on the caregiver. <laughs> and I hate to interrupt, um, but caregiver, if at all possible, um, and this is coming from working with families every day, their loved ones that are um, dealing with the, you know, with dementia, and they're at a point, obviously, they're meeting with me to discuss actual a senior living community option. 
um, caregiver, caregiver burnout um, and caregiver guilt are very, very real things. Um, I have conversations daily with family members who feel like um, they have, unbeknownst to them, over that progression that you were talking about, Kathy, they have become 100% a caregiver. You know, they, they mm -hmm. tend to no longer be the son or the daughter or the brother or the spouse. Their number one um, kind of title that they've eventually led themselves into is that caregiver. And the idea of um, not just moving into their loved one into a community, um, but even for instance, you know, with you guys bringing caregivers into the house to help out, a lot of times they feel like they failed, um, that they should be able to still do it, uh, that other people may judge them if they get help or if they look at communities. Um, if, if anybody ever feels that way, please pick up the phone and call me, call Eric, call Kathy. That is not the case. You guys are not alone. It is very, very hard. There is a reason that um, you guys' company, my company, we employ so many people every day to be caregivers because that help is needed. Um, mm -hmm. You have to think of your health. You have to think of the other things that you enjoy doing. It's, it's, it is not bad to go and do something you enjoy. Um, so please, I, I'm a very, very strong advocate for caregiver support. Um, and really having that conversation up front with your friends, with your other family members, so that it eases the burden down the road um, on yourselves and your loved ones. Um, and we're obviously always here to help and support and give advice. But sorry, that was my, my no. little PSA there this morning. <laughs> I'm very passionate about that, if you can tell. And, and like I said, I talk to families all the time. And I just want to hug them all because they're doing so much and it's exhausting, but they're scared to let others in and help. And it's okay to ask for help. So yeah, really, that's it. Definitely. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> yeah. I, and I think too, Brooke, along with that, and I think what, you know, this list of documents in this section is important is you're talking about caregiver burnout and all that is, you know, medical decisions, legal decisions and financial decisions with individuals that are fully cognitive are very, very stressful on their own. And what this section is about is one, having the difficult conversations now, but getting these documents in place and going through this process with professionals. You'd be going through this with you know, attorneys or financial professionals will help articulate what the individual's wishes are get them on paper, get the legal format in place. So when that individual's cognitive abilities has digressed to a point where they cannot, you know, rationally participate in these decisions, they are now, they're on paper, you know what their wishes are. And so then the caregiver doesn't need to further stress, are they doing the right thing? Is this what my husband, my wife, mom, or dad would want, this will all be taken care of. And so I think, you know, Brooke, to your point about caregiver stress, all of this, while it is stressful and kind of awkward to put in place, is designed 100% to reduce that stress later on when it would be almost impossible to kind of deal with that um, with the person living with dementia. So, um, that's my PSA, Kathy, keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll see here on this slide that there are three documents that support medical needs. Um, the first one is a living will. This uh, describes and instructs how the person wants their end of life health care managed. Um, there is also a thing that goes along with a living will or can be used separately. It's called the five wishes. Um, where you can sit down and they, it talks about how, how you want to be treated in the end stages of your life. Now, with your living will, it's very important that there is a copy and with a, a person with your love, for your loved one with you. You need to make sure that the loved one's doctor has a copy of the living will and make sure that there is a copy in any hospital records that they may have. Um, durable power of attorney for health care. This gives a designated person the authority to make health care decisions for, on your behalf if you are living with dementia and can no longer make those decisions. There is also a do not resuscitate order or DNR. 
This instructs healthcare professionals not to perform CPR in case of a stopped heart or stopped breathing. Um, it's really important too that the DNR be posted somewhere very visible in the home, wherever they call home. Um, you, if you tell the EMTs that there is a DNR in place, you just tell them, but you can't prove it, they're going to do CPR and that could be very much uh, against the wishes of the person living with dementia. There's some legal forms that you need to have in place. Um, one is a will. This kind of indicates how um, the person's assets and their estate will be distributed among the beneficiaries after they pass. Um, durable power of attorney for finances. Um, it gives a designated person the authority to make legal and financial decisions for the person living with dementia. And a living trust. This gives a designated person or what they call a trustee the authority to hold and distribute property and funds for the person living with dementia. But it's very, very important that you completely trust the people that you are giving this power to and trust that they are going to one, follow your wishes and two, they're not gonna abuse the privilege. So there are some planning tips. Um, this is a very touchy subject, I know, and I don't like to have them, most people don't, but the sooner you have them, the sooner you can get everything in place and you can enjoy your time together now and you can enjoy um, the future. So you wanna look at your plans regularly and over time, make sure your important papers and copies of legal documents are all in one place and that you know where they are and the person living with dementia does not because they do have a tendency to hide things from themselves and you can't find them. And you want to make sure that another trusted family member or friend knows where you put those important papers and update them as, as needed, um, especially wills. Plan for the future. Nobody ever wants to be sick or disabled, um, but planning can make all the difference in the world as the dementia progresses. And Kathy, real quick on the planning tips. If you or someone else is, you know, named the trustee or the power of attorney to make these decisions, you should also have a backup plan in case something happens to you. Because the person living with dementia may survive you. Um, and so you should have that kind of backup plan to your backup plan because again, you may put this in place and five years later, something happens to you and the person living with dementia doesn't have the cognitive ability really to express their wishes on who that you know, second or third tier backup plan is. So think ahead, you know, think in terms of survivability, et cetera, when you're you know, planning for the future. And, you know, and again, if the person has the cognitive ability, you want them to enter into that conversation. So their wishes are always you know, kind of ingrained and memorialized in any of these documents. So some conversation tips to have these difficult conversations is one to start them early. Um, the, de the rate of decline differs from person to person with dementia. Some go south pretty quickly. Some can live a very long time in a mild or moderate stage. Um, but his or, her, his or her ability to be involved in planning is definitely going to decline over time. Break the conversations into parts. Try different times and locations. It doesn't have to be done all at one time. Try to avoid having conversations like this on the telephone or in email or in a text. Try to have them in person. It, it just, while it may be uncomfortable to face them, it's really an easier thing to do than you think. Um, and again, don't feel like it all has to be done in one, at one time. It might help if planning is done in smaller segments, like maybe you do financial documents one day, you do legal documents another day. Um, you can break it up, just make sure it gets done. And a lot of times it will help to start these conversations while you're at lunch or dinner. Um, involve other people as you need to. Um, invite others to talk about finances. 
Um, you could look to financial advisors, bankers, elder law attorneys can all help with these conversations and setting up these documents. Involve mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers. Um, some families make decisions to pool their resources together to ensure that care can be provided for mom and dad or their loved one and that the expenses can be paid. And it's really important to help the person living with dementia understand why their financial position is so important. It's not so that you are taking their money or their property away from them. It's so that you can help them make the, lot, the best long-term care choices while they are still able to help you do that. So one of the things that we're gonna ask you to do is to connect. You just tell them we're in this together and we need to make sure that we have a plan in place to take care of you. Reassure them that they will be a part of the process now and in the future, always, this is their life. And kind of learn from them what, ask questions, um, what, ask them what they have in place. Do you have a will? Do you have um, powers of attorney set up? Do you have a DNR? Where do you keep them? Who has copies and who do you want to have copies? Who should review those documents with you and how often should you review those documents? And then for the help part, you wanna get them all together, including banking information, insurance and life insurance, any titles or deeds, make sure that they are all up to date. And is there anything else, any other document that needs to be added to the collection of paperwork? So plan for the future. No one ever again plans to be sick or disabled, but this can make all the difference in the world to a person living with dementia. Yeah, I'll say real quick on that last thing, um, and people, you know, we didn't put this in this presentation, but uh, I know between Kathy, Brooke, and I, we have lots of really good contacts about people. I know people that all they do is help people get organized. You know, they're not a lawyer or, um, you know, a, a, a financial person, but they just help people organize their documents in the senior setting. So they kind of know what to look for, the best way to organize, et cetera. We do know, I know attorneys that do this kind of work. Um, and, you know, reasonably priced. And we know people in the financial world that can help organize their finances and put the, the necessary structures in place. So anybody, you know, this is pretty much in the Richmond area is where kind of Kathy and I and Brooke have kind of our uh, expert contacts. But, you know, we do know the right people or good people in order to kind of help with that. And I'll, and I'll say, um, and we'll talk, you know, we won't really talk a lot about it, but um, I can tell you that, you know, Assisting Hands and Brookdale can provide care and provide support. Um, it's, it's not inexpensive. And so you need to plan for it and need to be read, ready for it. And I know that in case of Assisting Hands, um, only certain long-term care insurance actually pays for our services, but most of our clients are paying out of pocket. It's private pay. And so the sooner you're thinking about this, the better prepared you're going to be for that. Um, and so, you know, again, we cannot um, really stress enough about good planning and getting out in front of this sooner rather than later is going to give you more options for uh, providing care um, for yourself if you have dementia or loved ones that are living with dementia, so. So some final thoughts, and Brooke, this is addresses what you were talking about earlier with caregivers. Don't forget about yourself. Caring for a person living with dementia is challenging work and it's ongoing. It's not gonna stop. It's a marathon, not a sprint. And that means you have to take care of yourself. So you want to prepare for the road ahead. The more you learn about your loved one's disease and how it will progress over the years, the better you'll be able to prepare for future challenges, reduce your frustration and foster reasonable expectations. Um, develop a personal support plan. Um, 
Balancing the enormous task of caring for a cognitively impaired adult with other responsibilities requires skill, attention, and meticulous planning. By focusing so diligently on your loved one's needs, it's very easy to fall into the trap of neglecting your own needs um, and your own welfare. If you're not getting the physical and emotional support you need, you won't be able to provide the best level of care and you face being uh, becoming overwhelmed yourself. So you want to be able to cope with changes in communication. Um, as your loved one's dementia progresses, you'll notice changes in communication. They're gonna have trouble finding words. Um, they're gonna have increased hand gestures because they can't find their words. Easily, easily confused and even inappropriate outbursts are very normal with dementia. Avoid becoming frustrated by empathizing and remembering your loved one can't help their condition. Making them feel safe rather than stressed will make communication easier. And if you feel like your fuse is getting to the point that it's too short, take a break, walk away, take, get some fresh air and then come back to it later. Uh, develop day-to-day -day routines. Routines are, keeping a routine is the best way to work with someone living with dementia. They get used to those routines. And if you step out of bounds of them, that's really when they become frustrated and they can develop problem behaviors. Um, one of the major challenges that you'll see caring for a loved one with a dementia is coping with the troubling behavior and personality changes that often occur. These behaviors can include being aggressive, wandering, hallucinations, and eating or sleeping difficulties can be distressing to witness and make your role as a caregiver even more difficult. These behavioral uh, issues are generally triggered or exacerbated by your loved one's inability to deal with their own stress, their frustration levels at attempts to communicate, or their environment. By making very simple changes, you can help ease your loved one's stress and improve their well-being along with your own caregiving experience. Make time for reflection to help with acceptance. One of the biggest challenges as a caregiver for someone with dementia is to accept what is happening to your loved one. At each new stage of the disease, you're gonna to have to alter your expectations about what your loved one is capable of. And by accepting the new reality and taking time to reflect on these changes, it helps you better cope with the emotional loss and deepen the feelings of satisfaction in your caregiving role. But remember, if a friend or a family member asks if they can help you, the correct answer is almost always yes. So talk about it. Remember, no one person can provide all of the support alone. It is a marathon, not a sprint, and it means you have to take care of yourself. Prioritize self-care and accept help whenever it's available. If you experience signs of caregiver depression or anxiety, Seek help from a doctor or a therapist. These are definitely treatable conditions and getting the right support for yourself can help you sustain the energy that you need to continue your caregiving. And then we've got some dementia resources for you. Um, first and foremost is Tipa Snow. She has um, a thing called the positive approach to care. And that's one of the things that we have based our workshops on. Um, Tipa Snow is world renowned for her work with dementia and the different things that she comes up to help people. Uh, she offers um, free webinars and seminars to people living with dementia. She also has on Facebook every morning at eight and every afternoon at five, She'll do a live presentation and she'll pick one particular topic or a question that she's been asked to answer it. Um, very, very informative. Um, there's also AARP of Virginia. They're in uh, downtown Virginia, but they have a lot of resources 
um, that they can use for you. They've also got some financial resources that they can help with. Then there's the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. George Worthington is the contact over there. He is a wealth of information and he always has an open door policy. Um, then we have the Alzheimer's Association. Um, the Greater Richmond chapter is ran by Marie Calendo. Again, she is a wealth of information and she also has an open door policy. And there is another resource that we don't have listed here that I've learned about very recently. It's a new streaming TV called Saltbox TV. Saltbox is uh, dedicated to seniors. They have a lot of uh, good seminars and webinars on there with wellness and health activities. Tipa also puts a lot of her webinars on Saltbox so that you can watch them at any time. And then of course, um, there's always us here at Assisting Hands. We are happy to help anywhere you call home. That could be a house, an apartment, or an assisted living or uh, SNF, but we're there to help wherever you call home. And then Brookdale Midlothian, um, Brooke has a fabulous community there. Their um, memory center is top notch. They've got great staff. Brooke, Eric and I all have an open door policy. We welcome questions, concerns. Um, we'll try to help you whatever way we can. So with that, I'd like to ask another poll question and see how many of you are interested and learning more about um, in-home care for dementia support or memory care support. We could just take a minute to answer that right quick. And while you know, we're finishing up this poll, we are going to, you know, we can open up to questions. We can do some questions right now and then um, I can also turn off the recording if people would be more comfortable uh, asking questions. Um, we're not recording. And then we can all, you know, Kathy, Brooke, or I, you have our contact information, would always um, be uh, happy to um, speak with you all one on one. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the polling. It looks like we had, you know, people that are interested in learning more about those uh, services. So. Okay. So why don't we open up for questions? You can, oh no, sorry. Why don't you do this yep. first, Kathy? Or I'll yep. do it, let me do it, I'll do it real okay. quick. you'll do it. All right, so the next um, workshop is gonna be Thursday, July 8th. Um, you know, probably will be 10 a.m. Um, we haven't, um, you know, finalized that, but that's most likely. I will tell you, this is the this next workshop is called the Gems. is my favorite of all of our workshops. It really dives into uh, different stages of dementia um, and kind of some strategies on how to best support and care for the individual with dementia. It helps you understand a lot about what they're going through and the way to kind of go through that. So it's called the Gems, and what I love about this is. Uh, this is Tipa Snow's kind of way to describe the different um, levels of dementia. And many of the ones that are out there are very clinical. They're like numbered or whatever. This one is assigned a precious gem to each of the stages. And it's kind of recognizing that the individuals living with dementia are precious in their own right. And so it, it's coming from a place of care and how precious that individual is. So I love it. I highly encourage you guys to um, tune in for that one as well. Um, if you're on this workshop, you're automatically will get emailed uh, when the next one's coming out. Um, and also I'd like to say this workshop, we've recorded it. We're gonna post it on our YouTube channel, Assisting Hands YouTube channel, and I'll email out both copies of the recording, link to the recording, as well as this presentation to everybody who uh, registered for the workshop. And um, anyway, so hopefully you'll be able to join us. So we'll open it up for questions uh, in chat box or just take yourself off mute. And most likely Kathy or Brooke will be able to answer them, but you know, sometimes I'll take a shot. 
So. Well, before we answer questions, let me just remind everyone that um, recordings of the workshop will be available um, on our YouTube channel and Eric will email you a link. Um, and also if anyone needs a certificate of completion, they do not qualify for uh, CEUs, but they do qualify for some other things. I'll be glad to um, send you a certificate of completion if you'll just email me um, with your name and where I should send it back. I'll be glad to do that for you. Um, so now, questions. Are any comments, you know, any, anybody, um, you know, we do have people that have experience of dementia on this. Anybody want to add anything to the conversation? Uh, feel free. This is a um, good time to do that. We are getting some, all right. So <clears throat> Michelle, <clears throat> we'll take your information down and we'll make sure you got uh, a certificate. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop recording um, here, and then we'll, you know, see if anybody wants to kind of talk off the record, so to speak. All right, so anyway, thank you all for joining us. I'm going to stop recording now.